Um, this is the oral history, oral histories of Holocaust survivors class, interview number three with Rosa Mark. Um, I'm Allison Sasser, the interviewer. I'm Katie Hall, the note taker. And the comment is the audience. Um, so during the last interview, you said that when you came to the U.S., you mentioned um, that you went to school, but you were put in the wrong grade. Is that right? I was put in the wrong grade because I couldn't speak any English. And my mm -hmm. uncle and aunt um, had no children. They had no uh, experience with but taking a child to school. And so dependent on the superintendent in the building had a daughter. But she was younger than I. And she took me along and it just put me in her place. So by the time I realized I was in the wrong place, mm -hmm. I knew enough English. It was the time that I had to, um, to leave school. I was in 16. And I had to start working because my uncle had not been well altogether, but he came, became to the point. They really, the finances were limited and I just needed funds. A lot of people in those days didn't necessarily finish school. They, um, they went to work. Mm -hmm. So how did you learn English? Well, I learned English in class. And then they had a very nice woman teacher who um, was really like after class like once or twice a week but she kept there were several other children who were in and she sort of told us something ah, and you mentioned you worked in a knitting factory right Pardon me? you worked in a knitting factory and this manufacturing a knitting knitting factory after knitting. You went to oh, a knitting friend. I'm sorry. <laughs> I did not tell. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. I I went um, to hire. They had an employment offer, and they found me a job in a knitting factory, who were making gloves for the army and navy on, on machines, not hand knitting. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a great need for that because America was starting like to realize that they needed to um, leave up their military. Mm -hmm. And um, it was hard work because I wasn't used to being in a factory and I wasn't used to, um, you know, all the things that go along with factory. And then how long after that did you go to business school? Um, I went to business school about two years later. But uh, while I was going to the knitting factory, there was also classes at night for immigrant high school, evening classes for, for new Americans, I guess they call them. So I attended those classes and we learned certain basic poems, well-known poems that everybody usually learns in high school and how to pronounce things and uh, some, you know, well-known, not stories, we didn't really, but uh, poems. And the teacher, when we said a word like, would correct us and make it, make it pronounce it over again. Mm -hmm. So that was a big help. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any of the poems that you learned? <laughs> I think the beginning of one is, Roll on, da da, in deep blue ocean. I don't know how it goes. Do you know that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> and in other words, you had to, you do the R's because Germans pronounce the cannot pronounce the R. Mm -hmm. So hold on that dark and, you know, made you pronounce. Mm -hmm. And then you said you were an administrative assistant? Right? I was what? An administrative assistant? Receptionist? Oh yes. Uh, later on, uh, I had to move in with an American family because um, my uncle was only a one-bedroom apartment. I was left in the living room. And my uncle started to wander at night because he wasn't well. Pat, you know, I mean, give me a lovingly hug or thing, but I couldn't sleep, you know, and I knew that I needed rest at night. And it was too, um, too crowded for someone who wasn't well to have, have me in the apartment. So I had a girlfriend who had a setup in an American family where she went to work during the day. But in the evening, she babysat 
and help with the dishes and cleaning up. And, um, you know, did all kinds of little chores. And for that, she had room and boards. In other words, the room was free. And when she was with the children every time, yeah, she ate. And so she found another very nice family. And I lived with her. In the meantime, my uncle had passed away. And then as time went on, the last about year and a half before I got married, I had moved back to Manhattan. That was in Florida. And so um, also it became <coughs> sort of difficult because um, it was a very long commute to Manhattan from Flatbush, New York. So I used to have to take the trolley, wait for the trolley, maybe 15, 20 minutes, sometimes I don't know how long, and get on the subway in Flatbush. That was the last stop of the and go into Manhattan, and the office where I worked was on Madison. So in the meantime, I'd gotten <clears throat> this job at the office because someone next door, the Liebermans where I li lived to them in Brooklyn, knew that there was an opening in, in the office, a standard plan. I think I mentioned it to you last mm -hmm. time. Did I tell you the story about the um, the man in charge of employment and, and that, I don't know what they call it. Um, why don't you retell it just in case? Tell it again? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> when I heard about the opening, I went to apply for it because I hadn't been well at all. I was always worried. Didn't know, have any news about my parents. Didn't know if they had survived. And, um, I know I just couldn't keep going in that factory shop because both physically and mentally it was very much a fact. So when I went for the interview, his name was Mr. Lemke. He, there were about 500 employees in that office. It was the main office of Standard Brands, which you could compare today to general food. Huge, huge, with a lot of different um, items that they had different companies divided up and the whole comp the whole thing was called Stan. So when I went to interview, he spoke to me and heard my background and he wanted to know if I had been in high school. And I didn't have a diploma for high school, but I had started <coughs> to go to business. He said to me, well, you don't have enough sufficient education to perform the job that you need, and we require high. So I had heard and I knew that actually <clears throat> the standard brands, from out of the 500 employees, they maybe had one or two other. So I said to me, it's maybe one, I said to him, I said, is maybe one of the reasons you're not hiring me because I'm sure. <laughs> he was a little startled, but I said that to him. And he said, oh, no, no, no. It's just that you don't have enough ed education, but I will hire you if you promise that you keep going to school and that you complete. And this so then I started the job. <coughs> it, um, the job is, the way they usually hire people is this, you start in the mail room. This way you acquaint yourself of all the different departments because there's all kinds of different departments. Uh, and then you graduate to another department. And then I was put into the filing. In the filing department, they had a woman in there who, who years, ago, years ago would be type a typical old maid. Today when people don't marry they're not old maids. They should usually have not a choice so there's some reason why they didn't get them career that's good enough. So when I worked there <coughs> for a while she said um, they need someone in the international department because they have their own file and um, I'll put it on there. So I went down to the international 
And it's very interesting. I love that department. And uh, then they gave me two other girls to work with me. These two girls had finished high school. They were Native American. And I was their boss. Which, you know, it's not the greatest setup, but they, they were willing to. They knew I knew that they were. And then eventually, <clears throat> in the international division, I was very good at the filing and the system that developed some of my own. And the big shot bosses, they were all vice presidents, people like that, whose file I, I stored, I guess, were always looking for their file. So whenever they were looking, I didn't have the file. They had the file in their desk. So I said to them, you know, I know exactly what file you're looking for. I can tell you what it's about, but I don't have it. If you let me check your desk. Okay. And that's the way it was mostly. They had it. So <clears throat> after about the, um, there was a sales promotion manager for the international division and an advertising. They said to me, instead of filing, we'd like you to come and, and work for us. You know, I have a blog. What do they call some another secretary? I mentioned it last time. Uh, you know. Administrative assistant? Uh, uh, what? Administrative assistant? Administrative assistant. Administrative assistant, okay. Same. I don't know how to talk about it. Um, yeah. Admin. So I became the administrative assistant, but I had not come, when I decided to take the job, <clears throat> I had not consulted the woman who was in charge of it. She was very upset with me, and she said, all this has to go to me because you work for me, and I have to give my okay that you get trained. And, oh, she was beside me. So I apologized. I said, I didn't know that I was supposed to do that procedure. So when they offered me the job, I sort of figured, that's okay, you know, I didn't know anything. So I stayed on that job. Till I got married. And how long were you um, that job for? Well, I see. I told my total time at Standard Plan was seven years, but five of those, I guess, were in five and a half were in New York, and the rest I later had a job here in other brands. This. Um, so when you were living in New York, how was it different or similar to when you were in Vienna? Was it a much different city or? Yes, it was a different city, but I was used to big city living. It's not like I came from a little village or a little town. So uh, we had a very nice group of young immigrants like myself. And to one girl or one boy, we met others and we sort of, we didn't have a club, but we had a, a core of people that we knew, and we were always introduced to other people, and I knew lots and lots of people. And also, um, I had uh, <coughs> befriended a cousin of my cousin, uh, who was very nice, an American woman. She was a teacher. She was about seven years older than I. And she used to invite me to her home. She was married. She did. And they'd always try to fix me up with dates. <laughs> she had a father-in-law who was in the Navy that I went out with a couple of times. And during the war, there were a lot of um, people, I think I mentioned last time, who were poor at, which means they, they weren't qualified to be in the But the boys I knew, who were in the service, I corresponded with a lot of them and kept in touch with all. And the girls, you know, at night we never really hesitated to go out. We were not afraid. And while I lived at the Lieberman, there were two subways I could take, the IRT or the BRT. I don't know what they call them. But anyway, both of them went in the general area where we lived on 27th and 
and M in flat. And um, the ligament had gone out. And, I've, and I was, many times I've been home at midnight and was suffering from somebody else's house. So it was 12 or 1 o'clock, and I'd walk in the street by myself. And one night when I walked, I remember there were two footsteps behind us that were too close, you know. Usually people keep a certain distance, especially at night when it's so quiet. So I had a feeling this, whoever it was, was up to no good. And sure enough, at one second, the guy grabbed me like this, you know, around my neck. But I had enough presence of mind to kick him with my feet, and he let go. And in the meantime, someone else had come along, and the guy just ran and disappeared. And I was really shook up. I was terribly shook. Nobody was home with the Lieberman. And I caught my cousin, you know, the one who's seven years older than I in Manhattan. They said, well, you want to come over here? They, but somehow I quieted down and it's just an experience. But anyway, I was lucky, you know. And uh, I don't know what else you want to know. When did uh, do you remember what year Benny arrived in the U.S.? Was that in your husband? Oh, no, when, when she arrived in the U.S.? Oh, she arrived just like the last person before the war. I mean, the last ship, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what it was like when you first saw her again? Yeah, I was real, real happy because I was pretty lonely here and uh, she was like having my sister here. How did you find each other? Oh, well, she was sponsored by my oh, uncle, right. the same as I, and that's the first thing mm -hmm. that, you know, where she came. And how long did she live in New York? She lived in New York all, um, for many, many years. She, her husband came eventually. She had two children, and um, she divorced her husband, I would say, in 1968, and she remarried and eventually moved to California, mm -hmm. and they moved to San Diego. But um, we kept in touch a lot, and then we had an apartment, Ben and I had an apartment in Florida, so they would go on cruises and then stop and see us for a week or two stay with us. And they were very big world time travelers and uh, they knew all the best restaurants. Her second husband knew the price of every cruise and everything. And he knew the price of the, you know, the Queen Mary's the largest um, ship. And someone once said to him, oh, wonder how much the Queen Mary the trip is around the world. So he knew it. They didn't go on that trip. He was like you call a real European, I don't know, in German they say Lebermann, that means, I'm trying to find the English word for Lebermann. Um, he was also a real typical Viennese, in other words, they always had fun, they didn't worry about the money. He said, um, sometimes when he talked and he said, when I die and I have more than $50 in the bank, I knew I didn't live right. <laughs> That's was it. And our philosophy was, who's going to take care of us if you lose your job and don't have any? Different uh, philosophy. Um, did you see your uh, childhood friends or other family members after the war? Well, I tried to find my aunt and uncle who went Belgium. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, I had the cousin who had lived with us, who was teaching the month, who was learning Montessori teaching at the, She had survived with her son in Poland. She was hidden by a Christian family. What is her name? Family? Family. Clara. K-L-A-R. Mm -hmm. And also, she had a brother and sister who 
So the sisters and son, she had two brothers. The one brother was um, was very much wounded in a ghetto. Um, they had a mask. My uncle was killed. They just took people and herded them to a cemetery outside of Poland, and they shot them all. And my cousin, that's her brother, Abraham, uh, was shot in the arm, but he made believe he was dead. So he, they piled more bodies on top of him, thinking that he was dead. He survived, but he had a great handicap in one arm. He could. So he survived, and then a younger brother, Charles, survived. He was hidden there. And so, but this is a long story. Her, her husband <coughs> had been an head of an uprising in Poland in the town where they lived. So they separated in, in the ghetto. He stayed in the ghetto, and she and her little boy were taken in by the Christian teacher and hidden in the attic. They lived in the attic for two years. And at one time, I understand, her husband sent a message that he would like to go and hide with her in the forest, but they would have to leave the boy with the teacher hidden. And she sent back somehow a message that she wouldn't do it. I didn't know about it till her son talked about it. So the outcome was that her husband, being head of an uprising in the ghetto, someone gave him away and he was killed. Her son and she survived in that hidden attic. And since my cousin was a teacher, she thought this little boy, I guess he maybe was sometime four years old or five, five every day, being there, there were books up in the attic. And she would get out all the books and teach him everything every day, more than two. And this man today won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry as the youngest person to win the Nobel Prize. That was year he won one. Let's see. Well, he just turned 70 because he was born the, when I went to Poland the last time and I was he was one of the younger people. He wasn't in his forty. <coughs> so my cousin Clara was invited to Sweden when her son was presented the Nobel. And they survived. And she found out her husband was killed. And a lot of the people who survived then were sent to, um, to camps. In Austria and in Germany, they were called some. Um, <laughs> they were like refugee camps, you know, after people who survived. And she was in one of the camps, and another cousin of mine had survived from another uncle's daughter. She was with them. And uh, the strangest part is I had a cousin <coughs> who had immigrated from Austria to Israel, then Palestine. He was only 17 years old. He was one of the pioneers. Did I mention that? You can mention him again. His name actually was Frederick, but in, in Israel they called him Israel. So this cousin was in the um, in the British army. There was a, a Jewish Division of the British Army. We call the Jewish Brigade. And he had gone to Austria and was helping refugees to settle back, to go to Palestine. But he didn't know that his cousins were in that camp. So they had no contact. His name had changed. They had a different name. And they only found out later that he could have helped them go to, you know. 
and my one other cousin who went, who also survived and was hidden, and her husband had been killed. She, um, we married a much older man, and she went to Australia. She moved to Sydney, Australia, because she didn't have anybody to sponsor her. To come. So, some of my cousins survived, but my mother was one of nine children. So there were a lot of cousins and people who And so this cousin, Clara, she came after the war and after she got papers from another cousin of hers on, on her mother's side. Mm -hmm. And this cousin on her mother's side was actually the teacher who was so nice that I got to know and befriended me and used to invite me to a house. So we were not related, but we each, we had a mutual cousin. Uh, did you become more or less religious after the war? No. no. <laughs> I know that some people, like my cousin Clara's mother, was not at all religious. She survived, but not my uncle. She had not been religious at all, but after she survived, her daughter was killed and her husband was killed, that was my uncle. She became very religious, as a matter of fact. She became crazy fanatic religion. That my cousin used to tell me, you know, you have to keep milk and dairy separate uh, and meat separate. So she'd go to the refrigerator and if she wanted to get a meat sandwich, and she by accident looked at the milk container. She wouldn't eat because she thought it was sinful. I mean, you know, crazy for that. I mean, this was sick. No, I, I really did not become that religious. After I married Verna, maybe I would have been a little more observant about dairy, you know, or, you know, restrictions and eating kosher, but we only placed no value on that. The aunt, actually what I didn't tell you, so I moved back to Manhattan after I lived with the Lieberman, mm -hmm. because my uncle's wife, my aunt, was <laughs> my uncle's wife, um, felt that I should come, maybe if I wanted to, I could come back and live. So I chose to do that because it was such a long commute from Brooklyn to Manhattan to work every day and on a half and more each way that I moved in with her. Then I also felt it was easier for me to live in Manhattan, not just for the commute, but socially. Because in those days, if you had a date, they came to your house, picked you up. You went usually in Manhattan because that's where all the action is. Then he had to take you home and take you back again. And I felt that really wasn't a good setup. And then also the Liebermans had planned to move to Long Island because in those days, in the um, 40s, there was a big movement of um, families moving out to Long Island. And they were ready to move. So they were very disappointed that I didn't move with them. They really felt almost hurt, but I felt for my future that was not safe. And what year did you move to Manhattan? What year did I move to Manhattan? I would say probably in 1940. Did you stay in touch with the Liebermans after you moved out? I stayed in touch very little because they were really kind of, I don't know about angry, but they felt, they felt bad that I, that I didn't want to move. The setup was good for them, you know, and I was, you know, and also I really didn't want them to have, the two boys they had were really bratty kids, <laughs> the, the, you know, boys, and I, I didn't, you know, it wasn't good for me to do that. Uh, did you experience any discrimination or prejudice when you came to the U.S.? Anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew that there was a anti, lot of anti-Semitism with Standard Bank because um, the people were just indoctrinated that 
very bad air visit. And uh, I don't know what else made him that way, but it was well known that if you really wanted a good position, all these companies like General Motors, uh, General Electric, uh, all the utilities, all the things, you could not be a head of any of these like on the boards or on the um, committees or whatever, if you will. And a lot of people change their names in those days. When you look at names today, you don't recognize that there's a Jewish background because they changed their, their identity. So a lot of it was hidden, it was known. Also in those days, for instance, um, Johns Hopkins University, all these they, they, were, they had a quota for Jews, and it was known that take a few, and that was Did you, uh, did you notice that changing after the war ended, or was it still... Yeah, what? Did you notice any changes after the war ended, or was it still... Yeah, I think there were changes after the war ended. I mean, I'm trying to figure out I guess there was a whole movement because also with the African Americans, they had served in the army, they were like, for a while they were all segregated, you know, the armed services. And maybe people got to know each other more and realized that all the stereotypes were not shut. Mm -hmm. um, so how and when did you meet your husband, Werner? <laughs> well, my girl, I had several girlfriends who were married because I was always usually the youngest in the class. So I was always getting fixed up for blind dates. And my girlfriend Erica, who had gotten me the job with the other family, she was already married. Couple of years. She was old. She was three years. She is three years older than I. She said to me, "Oh." I heard of somebody really nice, you ought to go on this date. And she was always fixing me up. So I said, I'm sick and tired of blind dates. I'm not going anymore, but I'll tell you what. Maybe I'll try it, but first you have to find out what he does, what he looks like, and all kinds of details, you know. <laughs> so she didn't really know Werner. She, he was a friend of a friend of her. <laughs> so she, she got his name and phone number and called him and told him. That before I'm going out, I need to know things. And I think he was very upset when that someone wanted all these details. But he figured, since I had enough nerve to do all that, he was going to meet me just for curiosity. <laughs> and we had a blind date, and we arranged the date so we're not going out by ourselves. To this girlfriend of ours, and our husband, and uh, he fixed up a girlfriend of mine with a date. And so there were, there were six of us, right? Oh. And the first day was on the tavern on the green. It's a nice place in, in, in Central Park. You ever hear of the tavern on the green? I'm mm -hmm. sure you have. I think it was closed recently. Huh? Recently it was closed. Yeah, I think that's all the year. So uh, we met first in front of um, one of the movie theaters on 42nd Street. I forgot which one, it's one of the hotels. And we all went to the tavern on the green. And there was a huge crowd on the tavern on the green. A lot of people Saturday night, outdoors. And we sat down, and the waiter took like forever. <laughs> so when the waiter finally came, Werner ordered his drink. So what did he do? He ordered two drinks. One. I said, oh boy. Now I made a shaker, but you don't know what a shaker is. Do you? you know what a shaker is? You know the word? <laughs> shaker is the Yiddish word for a trunk. <laughs> <laughs> I said, now I made a trunk, you know, <laughs> that's another category. Hold on, I'm just looking. Okay. Uh, and how did your children learn about you? They really didn't talk to I, I don't think I talked to my children that much, but when I made the tape, for Spielberg, see, they each got a copy, and they were able to um, <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> 
see that. And also, Stephen Salisbury said that at the end of both my tape and Verla's tape, the children could come in here and the family would be shown as a group. My younger daughter couldn't make that tape. So the only ones who are on the tape is my older. And they each have a tape. So if they listen to the tape, then but I never really went into detail. Was it strange to be raising a family Sorry. of your own? Was it strange to be raising a family of your own um, in America? You know, when you were a kid, you probably thought you were going to have a family. <laughs> you know. Was it strange? For you to raise a family in America? It wasn't really strange because, you know, we had friends who had children and we had, um, we lived in a very nice little neighborhood, a very modest home, and all the neighbors basically were in the same age group. The men had gone into the service and they were able to, um, you know, have enough to start little starter homes. So the whole neighborhood was like very close. And um, the only thing I noticed is in those days, parents used to buy a book called Dr. Spock. You ever hear of him? He's the one, he's like the Bible had to raise children. Mm -hmm. And I never looked at that book mm -hmm. and I never saw it. Everybody always thought about Dr. Spock. And I felt I didn't need Dr. I tried to use some common sense and what I thought was right and what to do. And they were always looking up Dr. Spock. And in, in, in all the years, I've never yet heard that. <laughs> so we are really basically are very lucky. We have two very good daughters. I mean, not goody goody, but they never got into trouble. Luckily, in those days, marijuana was already taking place in the high school and colleges and uh, I'm sure they were exposed to all kinds of stuff. I mean, they didn't tell me what's going on in college, but <laughs> it was at the point that I just never worried about it. I never worried that, you know, that I had to keep track of them. And I would say the only one I ever know got a little spanking for me was Eve, the older one, because <clears throat> I had told her, when you play ball on the sidewalk, if it rolls into the street, you're never to catch, catch the ball. You just let me know and I'll catch the ball. And I guess one day she forgot it. And she did go in the street and I saw it. So I took her and I gave a few on her behind. But that's the only time she got a whack. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that she needs to remember, you know. Are both of your children living in Maryland? They're all, They're all here? Yeah, only in both. Um, not our grandchildren, but our, children. Mm -hmm. our grandson Jonathan that we took to uh, Europe mm -hmm. lives in London because <clears throat> he got a job. Uh, Jonathan graduated from Princeton and from Wharton, and he was with several big financial institutions even when he was like interning during summer months. And, uh, now for the last few years, quite a few years, he was stationed in England and he married an English Jewish girl and um, they have three children and they live in London, he's doing very well. And he's coming on a business trip November 1st and he's going to stop here for overnight, staying with And we really have I would say the closest ties with Jonathan because we were still young enough and Werner had semi-retired so we sort of, especially Werner instilled in him the family history of his hometown. He, he knows all about our lives, you know, especially Werner's 
and he speaks perfect German, not that we taught it to me. He learned it in school. He speaks also perfect French because I think Jonathan was one of the top French students in the USA, but I forgot. Mm -hmm. but anyway, very, very black. But the important thing I always tell him is to be a good person, you know. When you're smart, but a certain gift that you can develop being good. So Jonathan <coughs> went with us to Germany, and he's gone back a couple of times to Werner's hometown, and he took along his younger brother, Jason. Jason volunteered in the Israeli army. He served for two years, so three And he met his wife in it. And um, so he took Jason back to Germany to show him his room. Journey. Not where I come from because I never made much of them going back. There was nothing to see. It's an apartment building in a store, and but in Werner's case, it was a different store. Because the cemetery still didn't exist. Anymore. And our younger daughter, children, you know, was a little different somehow. We didn't instill in them that much of the past history, but they know all about it too, and their interest. I gave him, I have a little booklet where my mother wrote, like her last letter, pleading that we should try and see that they can come here. And, you know, sometimes we tell them everything. So, um, you've had two sons? Eve has two sons, and Debbie, the young one, has a daughter. We were yesterday for the housewarming, mm -hmm. and a son who is 27. He, Diane is a speech pathologist, and Adam is a uh, engineer, civil and industrial. And Jason, Eve's younger son, works for the University of Washington. He is there entertainment plan and everything that has to do with social lectures and things that have to be done here in Washington. And his wife, he met in Israel, but she actually lives only a few blocks away from where our Eve lives, I mean the parents. But she happened to be born in Israel because um, her parents at that time were living in Israel. So she's actually an American born in Israel, and they have a very, very deep love for Israel, and they have three little children also, just like Jonathan, so we have six great <laughs> <laughs> And they're very cute and smart. <laughs> they really are, and luckily they're, they're well, you know, it's lucky when you have children who are healthy. And they're very sweet to us as all of them because they're trained to be nice. Mm -hmm. Even though they're children and our children, but when it comes to us, they're very gentle and nice. When did you stop working at Standard Brands? You said you worked for them in Baltimore. Oh, yes. When did you yes. stop? Um, when we moved to Baltimore, for a while I was getting like a little bit settled, but then I got restless and I said, I'm going to look for a job. So I had this very good letter of recommendation for my boss. So there, I heard there was an opening at Lane Bryant's. You know, Lane Bryant's is a place for, for people in large size. And the manager interviewed me here in Lane Bryant. And he had me as a secretary. You know, his secretary was like a little lower than what I was looking for. Yeah. Right, so I worked for him. And after a while, he was always giving me dictation. I hate, I hate, I hate stenography because I myself in New York used to dictate. They used to have these, um, there were special kind of tapes where you dictate in the dictating machine and someone else types, you know. <laughs> okay, stay away. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he hired me and you know, I was newly married, and I was trying to have a nice dinner, 
And at five o'clock, he started giving me work in dictation. And I was ready to go home. So I worked him not quite a year. And I could never find anything to buy in Lane Bryant's because of a lot of time. And that was not my time. And really, the stars were terrible. So, I never, so then after a while, I also noticed that he had my sweat smell from alcohol. And my son, I got it to, to the grapevines and said he was really an alcoholic. So he said, so I said to myself, I'm going to quit that job. Can't stand. So one day I decided I had enough. I mean, I did my work, but. So I said, Mr. Walker, I'd like to give you notice. I'd like to leave. I'm giving you two weeks. No. He says, two weeks notice. He says, you're fired. Okay. I said, but you're going on record that I'm fired, right? I mean, I want to be sure that you're on record. Did you fire? He was happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I went and I registered with, with the unemployment. When you get fired, you're entitled to uh, a weekly, uh, what do you call it, pen, whatever it is, so you find another job. Unemployment. Unemployment. <coughs> so, and they could never find the right job for me in my category with my self. So I figured, well, right, for a while I'll take it easy. For a while I didn't work. But then I didn't have any friends here. We had this one bedroom furnished apartment in the basement. And um, I really got fed up with that. Really, seriously. I knew there was a um, district office at Standard Branch. You know, they had offices all over the United States and South America, all over. I forgot to say that this standard brands, their products were sold all over South America, Central America, and even in Japan they had a green. Why didn't you mention some of the products that they made? Well, today, today, yeah, all right. There's Fleischmann's yeast, there's VA, there's um, black and white label whiskey, there's... Um, Royal pudding, I don't think they make it anywhere before that. There were, I must say, a dozen products, I can't think of them. There were all different companies, but the umbrella was then. So uh, I said to myself, they have a district office here in Baltimore. I'm going to go up there one and see if they have it. I went up there with my letter of recommendation. And, uh, Mr. Meyer, Mayor, Christian Mayor, I come up there and he said, we have no opening, but the letter is just so wonderful. He said, I'm going to call him the new one. He calls, so he says, I have no opening. So he calls Mr. Lemke, the head of employment in New York, and he tells him that I'm applying. And Mr. Lemke says, you have no opening, don't let her go, hire her. <laughs> so I was hired and I really had very little to do because they really didn't need me, you know. I, you know, I kept busy, but you were not there. Like, you know. So I walked there and everybody was nice and they had never had a chew in the office before. They had no idea. So finally, they had an idea what it was like to work with. <laughs> What year was that? That was in 1948. How long were you there? Till I was, till I was thinking about being pregnant with Ethan. There was a girl there, her name was Marge. Her husband was going to law school and she was supporting him. Well, he was. So then Mr. Meyer told me one day, it's between you and Marge, we have to let one of you. I said, to be honest, we're going to start a family, hopefully, and let Margie have a job. Then Eve was born in 1950. 
and um, I maintained a friendship with the one girl who was the head secretary. And also remember one thing, Mr. Killian, <coughs> who was the district manager, Mr. Mayor was the office manager. He used to go, I used to open his mail. So one day I see a letter where they confirm his reservation for a golf vacation in, um, what is the name of that hotel run in Virginia? Where they didn't take shoes in the hotel. Greenbrier. Yeah, Greenbrier Hotel <coughs> was second. No shoes allowed. Have you ever heard of Greenbrier? Oh, it's a well known place. It's in the neighborhood. It's not far. Have you saw it? Greenbrier. In, in, in West Virginia. So I read in the letter, oh, we welcome your reservation and we look forward to to seeing you. And you know, we maintain our policy for, for a select client. In other words, it meant we still don't let you. Were you surprised by that? Pardon me? Were you surprised? No, I was. I just. You know, I never said anything to Mr. Killian. He was very nice to me. He was a lovely man. Well, you want to just say, pick it up and whoever it is. Is there anything else you want to add? I'm trying to think. <laughs> Either from this interview or in the past. I mean, this is our last interview, so anything you'd like to share that we didn't get to? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> well, I didn't speak about um, my life. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I spoke about working for... I didn't speak about working for the, um, for hire, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an important part of my life. Ten years that I worked. Do you know what hire is? Hebrew immigrant aid. Mm -hmm. Hire <laughs> stands for immigrant aid. So after my children were old enough, I really basically got very bored staying home and when the younger one started going to kindergarten I decided to look for something to do. So I first started a friend of mine who was working for hire. She was the um, assistant to the director of that college. And um, I said, you know, I'm really bored staying home. I'd like to do something. Maybe I'll can volunteer high. She said, yeah, come on over. And I spoke to Dr. Kaufman, and I used to go in there a time, a few hours, always making sure that I was home and the children came home. And uh, shortly after I worked as a volunteer for hire, a friend of mine who had a custom jewelry place said, come and work for me, you know, I'm paid. And, um, and you can work the hours you want to because I know you have to be home for you. So I left hires and I told him. So Dr. Coffin really didn't know I told him. So then Dr. Coffin called me up and he said, I didn't know you were looking for a paying job, why didn't you say? And I really didn't like the custom jewelry business, stringing beads and all that. And she was a friend of mine, I really didn't want to be. So I went back to hire. Are you on again? Are we on again? <laughs> so I started working for hire a few days a week, always making sure that I would be home on time. And I really liked this work very much. It was emotional, but it dealt with people who were having a case against the German government. But um, they had claims, you know, they were in concentration camps, their health was affected, their, um, whatever it was, you know, 
basically there were health claims also, <coughs> claims for property that was taken in order to the special forms, and um, they had to be filled out both in German and in English. So um, I was qualified to do that. I should stop in English. <laughs> I um, and I got to see people interview them and get the documentation they had um, a lot of them had to obtain doctor certificates sometimes from psychiatrists and from other health professionals to document <coughs> the claims and um, there was a certain kind of, it's hard to say, you know, all kinds of procedures that you had to take and then fill out the form and file them against the German government. And uh, it was hard for me to get downtown because I had to take a, a long streetcar ride and get to the, get to the bus. Uh, there's a streetcar and then sometimes a bus. So Dr. Kaufman said to me, why didn't you say so? It's hard for you to uh, get downtown. I'll come and pick you up every day when you come. So it was very nice to pick me up. I never went to work for her. And I worked there. Actually, Dr. Kaufman passed away about, so, <clears throat> after I worked there maybe five years. And then I, his, um, his assistant took over, who was happened to be a friend of mine. And, he doesn't and um, so I worked there for ten years. And in the many times I took the cases home with me because People used to tell me all their life story, what happened to them in extermination camps, in um, concentration camps. They told me about their experiences they had tried on them, you know, they, they used them as skinny pigs. And uh, in many cases, you know, I was able to obtain some small compensation. They got like a monthly pension. Mm -hmm. And many times later, I would meet people and they would thank me a hundred times. This woman is, is one of the people who went to the camp. She always comes up here to help her with some forms. And so I'm, I'm trying to think. So then after a while, the cases sort of slowed down and petered on. And I left tired. And I opened up a little clothing boutique with a friend because I needed to do something and she was a very good friend of mine but the arrangement didn't work out too good I stayed five years with it because Werner and her husband were very good friends and Werner kept telling me you gotta stay on you gotta stay on. I said I wanna quit I wanna quit I don't wanna I did stay on when you did you start doing that what year did I work for the highest I worked Highest from 1961 to 1977. And then you did the clothing proceed from 1971 until yeah. 76 or five years. Right. Um, then our older daughter Eve, uh, I stayed home for a while, and they had bought a house. They had gotten married in my and. They, they bought a beautiful, beautiful house, but they didn't really like the neighborhood was close to it. And Jonathan had been a babe. And they were looking to sell that house. And it was beautiful. It was a beautiful house. And uh, they put it up on the market, and they sold it within four weeks. Now they had this four-bedroom house. They sold, and they had no place to they asked if they could move in with us. So they moved into our house with their four bedroom furniture, mm -hmm. the whole place when they couldn't even walk through, and they stayed with us for a year. So we really got to know John, he was a baby, you know. And <coughs> then I got so bored, you know, Eve was in the kitchen, I was in the kitchen, small baby, I had to do something. So he said, why don't you try going for a real estate? I'm too old, I'm not going to help. But I did, I signed up for real estate. Took the classes, and I said, 
when the test time came and I had to take it, I said, I'm sure I failed. I'm not going to take it over again. The test came back, I had an A. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was in real estate, but basically only part. And I stayed with real estate quite a while, but I had a big conflict because a lot of real estate people tried to um, make the sale. I didn't financially need to make the sale if it interfered with my country. And, um, <clears throat> but I stayed with it because it kept me busy and when I had read it and slowly retired, when there was an open house on Sunday, he'd go with me and stay with me. And um, I got to know quite a few people. So basically that was okay because I didn't know what else I would want to do. And uh, my broker always said, I don't know, he said, he, he said, I used to complain about other salespeople because some were very unethical and they tried to pull all kinds of stuff. So I had to report them every week what was going on. So he says, if someone throws you a porcupine, I remember he said, throw it back at them. <laughs> but that's easy to say, you know. But I enjoyed some part of it because the people that I sold a house to or listed always knew that I really tried to do it in an honest way. And I got to know <coughs> several Russian families, Russian immigrants. And we're friends today. But one fellow even came up just a few weeks ago when they talked to Werner. They invited us to their weddings and their bas mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs. And uh, that part was not. But when we went, we were also going to Florida, we had bought a condo in Florida. So it was hard to keep up the real estate and go to Florida. So when I went to Florida, I had like a partner. If I had a listing, I made the people understand when I took it that I had a partner and that I may not be there myself. So that's what happened. Then after a while, I just let my license last because there's a lot of expense and love keeping up the license and not really being that active. So that goes back. So that was my last basic working. So when did that, when did you stop? What year was that? Well, it was back at least 15 years. I kept it up for a while, but it's hard to know because I really had it so part-time then towards mm -hmm. the end. What was your favorite job? Did you have a favorite? My favorite uh, job? Mm -hmm. I think my favorite job was with Standard Branch in New York. Mm -hmm. Because I got to know a lot of people, and a lot of people, I think, began to see the Jews don't have horns, you know? when they got mm -hmm. to know me. And everybody was very kind to me up there in Santa Fe. They insisted on making out my income tax for, for me, but then it's really time. They insisted on being in touch with the State Department to look for my parents. There was no point really to it, but they insisted on it. When I was dating Werner, these were all vice presidents in their office. They used to call me and, and talk to me. They liked talking. They didn't know that I was a liberal in those days. <laughs> And they were stance Republicans, you know. So they always wanted to know about my dating, you know. They were like, oh, my father. So when I started dating, when well, I was a little serious, came kind of glad. And I decided, he was, I knew he was getting me a gift and I was going to get him it. <laughs> so I knew he needed a wallet, so I went to Mark Cross. You know Mark Cross? That's the best letter store in, in New York. And I bought him a beautiful wallet for fifty dollars. That was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It was more than a week's salary. And so Mr. Linden, one of the vice presidents, called me in. He wanted to know my status with the dating. Mm -hmm. And I said, I bought her a, a wallet. He said, What did you spend? So I went to my club, spent fifty. Yeah, well, how can you spend?
spend so much money on a guy. Mm -hmm. And you know, he, he was all upset with me for mm -hmm. doing that. So I must say they were all so nice to me. I really had a feeling like people cared. Mm -hmm. Was it difficult working at Hyatt because you were hearing all these stories? Yeah, and the problem was not taking it home at night. That was a big, big problem, and I did take it. But I kept on going. But she learned that the geography of Poland and not and all the terrible things. I don't. Um, I don't know more. What was it? Um. And then also a lot of times, sometimes they conflicting story. Mm. And they talk. They'd really been somewhere else. They not meant, but I knew the story didn't matter. So I tried to explain to them. I could speak Yiddish and I could communicate. And they felt safe with me telling them. If you submit these papers, it doesn't make sense. And a real witness at one time also made it. And they check your story against their story, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So they started, you know, opening well, up. Some of these people didn't know. Uh, no, your life is that day. Mm -hmm. Do you care what? What the name of this camp is? It's immaterial. <clears throat> so that was, I mean, that was satisfying work, but my happiest work. Do you have anything more you want to add? Well, I appreciate you girls. Really 